Sorry about that. Uh, so we'll begin recording now. Thank you, Chichek, for reminding me of that. Uh, uh, and in the question and answer session, I think it makes most sense just to write in the chat to me or to everyone. It doesn't really matter if you have a question and then you can uh, turn your video and audio on and, uh, and, and ask away, of course. Uh, and hopefully, despite some of the awkwardness of the medium, uh, we'll, we'll have a lively uh, and uh, interactive session. So with that, I just want to begin with a few opening remarks, uh, and these will sound somewhat familiar to our participants because I circulated uh, some of them ahead of time, but I am going to share my screen now, uh, hopefully without too much difficulty or not. <laughs> For some reason, I can't find my, uh, this is, it's always amazing to me. Uh, I can't find my PowerPoint on here, but I'm gonna see if I can do it anyway. Let's see. How does that look to everyone? Good. Though I'm, I'm at the wrong place in my PowerPoint, so I'll have to move back. Thank you. Uh, there. <laughs> So, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, and before it, Roads Must Fall, have urgently called attention to monuments as embodiments of racism, both past and present, and oppression more broadly. And that's the context, really, that brings us uh, together today. Beyond a reckoning with the genealogies of racism and colonialism, these times of toppling statues invite a reflection on the contemporary politics of monumentalization. So to frame our discussion, uh, the members of my group and I have come up with six general themes which we'll highlight through six specific sites. Uh, and, you know, again, this is meant merely as a sort of scaffolding to the conversation and we can run with this uh, sort of, not typology, but a set of thematics or not, as the case may be. So uh, monuments as targets of mass indignation. Secondly, monuments as objects of institutional intervention. Thirdly, monuments as counter memories. Fourthly, monuments as monolithic expressions. Oh, sorry, monuments as satire. Fifthly, monuments as monolithic expressions of history and identity. And then finally, uh, monuments as sites of invisibility and inattention. So the first set of examples relates somewhat more directly to the recent uh, uh, controversy over racist statues, the Black Lives Matter and so forth. Whereas the second set of examples moves on to a variety of other contexts that provoke distinct yet at, in many ways uh, analogous uh, anxieties and aspirations. So first, uh, monuments as targets of mass indignation. Uh, on June 7th, as I'm sure many of you, uh, uh, probably all of you know, uh, protesters in Bristol toppled a bronze statue of notorious slaver Edward Colston and tossed it into the adjacent harbor. So there you see the, uh, the plinth in the aftermath, I suppose, uh, and Black Lives Matter scrawled on it. Uh, across the United States, statues of explorers, conquistadors, and confederates, as well as others, have fallen. So how might we conceptualize the power of statues to provoke such strong emotions and actions? It's deceptively easy to think of monuments as placeholders for abstract powers and therefore as convenient targets for public dissent against those powers. But what should we make of the politics and semiotics of mass indignation in relation to statues? More sharply, how should we comprehend the relationship between monuments and crowds? What's the difference between a crowd gathered to celebrate a monument and a crowd gathered to topple it? Secondly, monuments as objects of institutional intervention. So here you see uh, a monument to Theodore Roosevelt, really quite gut churning in my opinion, which uh, has been, uh, well, the Museum of Natural History in New York City. This is where it's stood and welcomed visitors since 1940, I believe, but they've now decided to remove it. So of course the broad political currents that have led to this decision to remove this statue, uh, a decision quite late in coming in my opinion, are more or less the same as those that have fueled Black Lives Matter and Roads Must Fall. And yet the act of removal in this case is an expression of institutional 
deliberation and authority rather than the outcry of mass protest that we see uh, at a site like uh, Colston statue or so many others in recent months. So does this matter that it's an institutional decision rather than an act of mass, uh, mass summoning of, of, and denunciation? Crowds and institutions are certainly different brokers of memory and, and, uh, and political actors, even if the object of their politics aligns. And so the removal of the Roosevelt statue also raises questions, uh, finally also raises questions about the material afterlives of toppled monuments. Uh, do they belong in museums? These are the sorts of questions that have been dealt with quite a lot, of course, particularly in the last 30 decades in post-communist uh, uh, contexts. Uh, are the monuments that no longer uh, abide by the politics of the present better left to sink beneath the sands of time, like Shelley's Ozymandias? So third, monuments as counter memories. Here you see uh, a classic in many ways, uh, equestrian statue by the artist Kahinde Wiley, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, which uh, now stands in front of the Virginian Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. And so this was erected in December of last year, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, as a lot of the debates that are, are currently on our minds were already uh, fueling the public sphere, but before the murder of George Floyd and, and some of the subsequent actions this summer. Uh, so, uh, rumors of war uh, was heralded as, a, quote, a direct response to the Confederate statues that line Monument Avenue a few blocks away. It's a striking reimagination of a Confederate general as a young African-American man. As counter memory, of course, it embodies and subverts generic features of the equestrian monument, the muscle bound steed, the imposing plinth, the triumphant visage. Uh, so I, I think it's important to ask what the capacities and limitations of such counter statues might be, counter monuments that is. As monuments to authoritative memories topple, what will become of their counter memories? Does the future of counter memory demand abandoning statues for a different form of monumentalization entirely, akin perhaps to the recent unrealized proposal, the monument may be a forest, which was a, a proposed tree nursery intended to commemorate the, the Holocaust in Warsaw. Uh, it hasn't been realized, but it was the winner of a prize uh, competition for a different form of monument there. So fourth, monuments as satire. In September, the bucolic Slovenian town of Sevnica, not too far away from where I am right now in Zagreb, Croatia, as it happens, witnessed the re-erection of an eccentric statue uh, uh, on its outskirts, a bronze portrayal of American First Lady and local daughter Melania Trump, designed by local craftsmen and commissioned by an American artist, Brad Downey. So the original was vandalized in an act of arson earlier this year. Uh, and then it was replaced by this bronze uh, version quite recently. Uh, rather than counter memory, this monument seems to be an act, or at least uh, in my interpretation, uh, aspire to an act of political satire aimed at the present. But can monumentalization capture satirical political critique in a way that persists, persists over time once the politics of the present have become the past? If so, how? In a different respect, the statue of Melania, which is the work of two men after all, also raises important questions concerning gender and monumentalization. In a world still over-occupied by monuments to men, what should we make of such satirical interventions that gloss over questions of gender, power, and history? Fifth, monuments as monolithic history and identity. So in Belgrade, a gargantuan statue of Stefan Nemanja, a 12th century Serbian grand prince, has begun to rise on the banks of the Sava River. Uh, this is uh, in keeping with other mass monumental forms that we've seen recently in places such as Skopje, Moscow, and beyond. The city's deputy mayor saluted the monument's inauguration with the following remarks, quote, today we visit history by building this monument. This is proof that Serbs are an ancient people with their own culture and tradition. These mega monuments to glorious pasts seem to gaze backward at the 19th century and its image of homogeneous nations that achieved their historical destiny through statehood, yet the anxieties of identity and difference they register seem to me to be distinctly contemporary. How might we reinterpret such unironic monolithic forms of monumentalization beyond standard criticisms of whitewashing history and identity? Should we? 
Finally, monuments as invisible. In 1927, Austrian novelist Robert Musil famously wrote that the remarkable thing about mon monuments is that one does not notice them. His remark is, seems to be out of step with the climate surrounding public statuary today, yet one artist has recently taken Musil at his word. In 2017 and 2018, Spanish sculptor Isaac Cordal placed miniature 15 centimeter figures in urban spaces across Europe. Most passers-by surely failed to notice these petite monuments. They were only rendered visible by media reports about them. Is the most appropriate form of monumentalization in the present invisibility? Why does this oxymoron, the invisible monument, incite aesthetic and political appreciation? What might invisible monuments teach us that counter monuments, not to mention monolithic monuments, cannot? Um, so that's about all that I have to say. Of course, uh, I'm sure I could come up with some other things if I was uh, compelled to, but I think it's time now uh, it, with the hope, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, uh, with the hope that this has, uh, has at least sparked some ideas uh, in, in, in our collective head uh, and individual heads uh, to move on to our speakers. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Susan Niemann. Uh, I, I almost pronounced your name in the German fashion. <laughs> I suppose you're probably hey, used to answer that. Answer to both. <laughs> Not a problem. Answer to both. Uh, uh, whom I, I really would like to thank again for joining us today. She's director of the Einstein Forum, uh, born in Atlanta, Georgia. Neiman <laughs> studied philosophy at Harvard and Freie Universität in Berlin and was professor of history at Yale and Tel Aviv. Philosophy, University. professor of philosophy. Oh, I've never professor of philosophy. History. Philosophy is my field. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm uh, speaking, uh, my mouth and my eyes are on two different tracks. Uh, Not a problem. Uh, professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel, Tel Aviv University. She is the author of Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, Fremde Zehen Anders, Moral Clarity, A Guide for Growing Up Idealists, Why Grow Up, Widerstand der Vernunft, ein Manifest in postfaktischen Zeiten. Hopefully my German doesn't sound too bad. And learning from the Germans, <laughs> learning from the Germans race and the memory of evil most recently, uh, which I, I can highly recommend uh, personally. And with that, uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Susan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, so then I want to respond to two claims that you made uh, that I don't think are quite right. Um, one was the question of whether the crowds or, or the institutions um, are, uh, are the ones who are active in taking down monuments and what the difference is. My own experience in the last few months um, doesn't really allow us to distinguish between those two. The institutions are very much uh, influenced by the crowds. I didn't talk to anybody at the Museum of Natural History, but one of the things that I was very cheered by and quite hopeful about was the fact that I participated in a lot of, I was asked to participate in a lot of Zoom discussions, both in Britain and the US, of people who are museum directors and people who work in museums and were incredibly thoughtful about all of these questions and they were really influenced by them. So I don't know what the timeline was uh, with, uh, you know, I have no behind the scenes information on taking down that chilling statue of, of Teddy Roosevelt, but I'm absolutely sure that the, the institutions are responding to what, what is going on in the streets. And I think that's terrific. Okay, so I, you know, I mean, in some cases they may be trying to anticipate criticism, in some cases they may be responding to it directly, but I don't think that's really such an important distinction right now, and I think that's a good thing. The other thing that I want to question as a woman is whether the statue of Melania Knauss Trump has anything whatsoever to do with gender. She doesn't have a feminist bone in her body. And anybody who was in doubt about that, uh, who's heard the, the, has been corrected by the recent tapes. This is someone who has played to the worst gender stereotypes of what it means to be a woman and whose entire life consists in those stereotypes. 
So I, I almost feel that it's sexist to raise the question of gender stereotyping in connection with that statue. Um, yeah, she happens to be a, biologically a woman in the same way that I'm biologically a woman, um, but I, I just don't see how it raises any questions of the kind that you were suggesting. Um, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm glad that they made it. I'm glad that they burned it down. I just, um, I don't think she deserves a place in a discussion of feminism or gender stereotypes. Okay. Um, that being said, I, uh, let me just say a few words because you asked us to introduce our own work. Let me say a few words about how my last book mm, fits in or doesn't fit into your, your six types of, uh, of monument questions, or I'm not sure how you want to call them, your categories of, of monuments, I, um, which I think are interesting categories. Uh, my last book, I should say to people who don't know it, is something that I began working on in 2015, which was the moment at which I think you can agree that American Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, for those who know German, began. Uh, Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung is something that I translate as working off the past. And it's something that the German nation has been more or less ten tenuously and tentatively involved in uh, since the, well, were there, was anybody really involved in it since the end of the war? Yes, the leaders of uh, East Germany were definitely thinking about what their relationship was to the Nazi past. Um, the long story, I won't go into it in detail or how the two Germanys responded differently to their Nazi history, but what is true is that um, what the Germans did was, as a collective now, if you take the two halves, what they did was historically uh, unique. We tend to think, given the symbolic importance of the Nazis in thinking about history, um, people outside Germany tend to think that the minute the war was over, the Germans realized what crimes they'd committed and got down on their knees and begged for atonement. That's a natural thing to think. I think it's been very much fed by the fact that the most iconic post-war German photograph was Willy, Willy Brandt on his knees in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. What people don't know is how many people in Germany, really very much the majority, hated Brandt for doing that gesture in 1970. There was an enormous opposition to him and he left office for different reasons um, just a year and a half later, um, but he very much didn't have popular support for that gesture. In fact, uh, Adenauer campaigned against him uh, in 1962, so only eight years before that, and he campaigned against him with the slogan, what was Herr Brandt doing abroad for 12 years? We know what we were doing in Germany. This should show people um, you know, how reluctant uh, West Germany was, not only to acknowledge any responsibility for the Nazi crimes initially, but uh, to think of themselves as the war's worst victims. And it's a big shock um, when people realize that that was, that was the defining trope. One of the things for me in my research, I wanted, I, I began thinking about ways in which my own knowledge of the, the German experience might be useful as the American discussion began in 2015 with the massacre of nine churchgoers in Charleston. President Obama was the first major politician to call for 
taking down Confederate monuments and taking down the Confederate flag. And it was a moment at which people began to think about the connection between the violence in American history and the violence in America today, and to realize that you couldn't deal with the one without examining the other. So I decided I was gonna write a book uh, because I have been thinking about the German experience for more than three decades and thought it might be useful to uh, Americans. And uh, the first thing that occurred to me in, in reading um, memoirs that were written shortly after the war was the extent to which post-war West Germans sounded like defenders of the American lost cause, that is people who are still in mourning for the Confederacy and who still create this sense of victimhood. We lost the war, our cities were in ashes and ruins, our men were in POW camps, uh, we were hungry, yet just barely alive, and on top of that, uh, the damn Yankees wanted to tell us that the war was all our fault. And um, those tropes were exactly used by, um, uh, you know, post-war West Germans, and they're still in use today uh, in, in serious parts of the United States. And what I realized in thinking about that was actually it's quite natural, the natural movement of, um, of all human beings is to want to idealize and heroicize their people. And when that turns out to be impossible, uh, the next best thing is to say we were victims. You know, they would have been heroes, but history prevented that, and so they were victims. And those are very natural movements. What wasn't natural, and why the German case is really groundbreaking, is was to say that, um, yeah, we suffered, but other people suffered more and it was our fault. That is to acknowledge, to move from being a victim to being a, a perpetrator. So that's um, some of the you know, basic theses of my book. And um, I did a lot of interviewing, um, you know, told a lot of stories, both in the deep South and, uh, and in Germany. And focusing on the monuments question, one of the things that seems most important to me is also fairly banal, at least it seems banal once you've thought about it, but it gets lost in the discussion in the States. The discussion is, uh, are the monuments about history or are they about hate? And of course, defenders of keeping them wanna say they're about history and we shouldn't tear them down and defenders, uh, people who want to tear them down say no, they're about hate and they hurt people um, who are on the other side. So um, Mitch Landrieu, who is the governor of uh, New Orleans, uh, who argued and did take down these four very prominent statues to the Confederacy, uh, gave a beautiful speech when he did so, but there's one um, part of the speech that I don't think is quite right. He said, we should think about the monuments from the perspective of a 10-year-old black girl who is walking by this huge statue of Robert E. Lee, the um, commander-in-chief of the Confederate armies, um, and doesn't feel he's there to encourage or inspire her. Now, that's right as far as it goes, but it seems to me you also have to add, I don't want a 10-year-old white boy walking by the statue of Robert E. Lee and feeling that's my inspiration. That's what a man is supposed to be. So what I feel is missing in this discussion is, is the idea that monuments are about values. We don't memorialize every bit of our history, right? We memorialize the men and the women. And you're right, not as many women as men, and that's something that ought to change. But we memorialize the men and women whose lives embodied values that we want our communities to honor and we want our communities to share. And, you know, that's something that I wish people would focus on because I think the, the next question is really, once we take down the Colsons and once we take down the statues of Johnny Reb and Robert E. Lee, 
which I do think need to go. I think uh, at least an awful lot of them should be in museums. Otherwise, you do run the danger of forgetting history. So um, Berlin has had some interesting experiments with what kind of museums to put them in. I think there are interesting alternatives. But for me, the most important question is, what are we going to put in the place of those monuments to values we no longer want to honor? Which values do we want to honor? And can communities have discussions together, you know, which could achieve some kind of consensus in a you know, reasonably democratic way? That's my hope. I'm not sure that it's going to take place, but um, I'll stop right there and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. One of the things that actually came to mind as you were speaking uh, was something that uh, I, I briefly had thought about uh, putting into this, into the mix as it were, which is the Stolpersteine, uh, the stumbling stones throughout Germany, which commemorate victims of the Holocaust uh, as uh, a very different kind of monumentalization, precisely because you stumble on them and it doesn't have that sort of gaze upward uh, focus. Uh, and in some ways it, it actually bypasses the question of values in, in an interesting way, but we'll talk more about that. I also should apologize about Melania. I agree entirely with you, of course, in your evaluation of her embodiment of femininity. Uh, and probably we should have thought of a different way to introduce questions of gender into the discussion. I think that was uh, uh, just a, uh, well, uh, uh, an oversight or perhaps a uh, stringency that we didn't quite manage, but uh, but I, 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 I can I just say something to this, and I, I and I I really mean this. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, this is, should be constructive criticism, um, not hostile. But I really think sometimes, in a haste to check the box, we've dealt with gender now, um, or or we've dealt with race now. Um, I think people need to think those things through. Yes, we all need to be careful. Um, we've all been unaware of factors of race and gender in the past, but let's not make it box checking. Let's make it thoughtful. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we'll move on now, but hopefully we have time for everyone to uh, ask as many questions as possible before 3.15 in your case. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our second speaker. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. I think from London in this case, uh, Rahul Rao is senior lecturer in politics at SOAS, University of London. He's the author of Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality and Third World Protest Between Home and the World, both published by Oxford University Press. And he's a member of the Radical Philosophy Collective and blogs at The Disorder of Things, a, a wonderful blog. So I'll turn it over to Rahul now, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great, okay. Um, I should maybe preface my comments by saying that I am by no means an expert on the post Habsburg and Ottoman worlds. Most of what I have to say um, <laughs> is sort of comes from the footprint of the British Empire. Um, and its afterlife. So those are the, the parts of the world that I've been most uh, attentive to. In, the Habsburgs and Ottomans are not part of the discussion today right. in any okay. overt way, so not to worry. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got a few slides up, mostly because I think the visuality of statue politics is quite um, interesting to contemplate. And I think much of uh, the power of these moments uh, derives from the visual spectacle that either bringing down or putting up a statue entails. So with that in mind, I'm going to try and share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, yes. I want to try and respond to maybe the first three of the prompts that Jeremy sent us. Um, and I'll go through them in turn and hopefully maybe bring some of the sites and context that I've been interested in to, to bear on those questions. Um, the first is this idea of monuments as targets of mass indignation. And like Jeremy, I want to begin with Colston. I'd started thinking about statues about five years ago when Roads Must Fall erupted in Cape Town and then came to Oxford. 
Um, and that year was seemed to be full of statue related stories or symbolic political stories, um, including the aftermath of the, the Dylan Roof massacre uh, that uh, I think Susan referenced, as well as um, an interesting protest against a Gandhi statue at the University of Accra, which called itself Gandhi Must Fall in a direct nod to Rhodes. And perhaps that's something we can also talk about a little bit later on, because I think it complicates in a really interesting way conversations about race and racial politics in a way that takes it beyond a kind of uh, black white binary and I mean that quite literally in, in, in terms of racial categories. What the, one of the things that interested me and maybe many people in the wake of Colston was what the protesters did to the statue. The drowning in Bristol Harbor to me did not seem incidental. It seemed like a very well thought through uh, way of deciding what the immediate fate of the statue should be. It was of course a direct reference to the fate of many enslaved people in the Middle Passage, including people that Colston himself would have enslaved. Um, a lot of things happened next very quickly, and I won't talk about all of this in detail, except maybe to pick up two or three things. Many other statues became a target for protest um, in London and elsewhere in the UK, and indeed the whole world, the US, Belgium, New Zealand. Um, it seemed like this was happening everywhere. Uh, a very interesting crowdsourced initiative called Topple the Racists uh, appeared in the UK, where the creators of this website invited people to contribute names of statues that they thought should go. Uh, and so in very short order, we saw the statue of Robert Milligan removed from outside the Museum of London. The mayor of London made this extraordinary announcement where he said, we've got to reevaluate the entirety of the built environment of London. And so he set up this commission, which I have to confess not knowing very much about to date because it hasn't really gotten off the ground yet. Boris Johnson, of course, was quick to weigh in in very Trumpian fashion saying, to tear down statues is to erase and whitewash history and so forth. And there was a very concerted reaction from white supremacists who a few weeks after Black Lives Matter protesters had targeted the statue of Churchill, gathered in the very same spaces in central London to, uh, to defend, quote unquote, these statues that they felt were under attack. So what I guess what interests me is the psychic and the affective investments of both the, the, the critics and the defenders of these statues. And I, I've been very intrigued by the way in which the, the kinds of treatment that protesters have subjected statues to. So maybe this gets us to thinking about the relationship between the crowd and the statue. Now, it's often said, you know, people often ask, what's the point of attacking a statue? What does it deliver in terms of material benefits to people? And I don't think it's difficult to make materialist arguments about the connections between these movements um, and, and their underlying states. For example, Rhodes Must Fall have said that they're using the statue as a metonym to talk about the racial demographics of staff and student bodies, the decolonization of the curriculum, the slowness of universities in South Africa to shed the legacies of apartheid. Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford saying very similar things. So the material stakes are not hard to discern. But I don't think it's incidental that protesters have drowned, strangled, burnt, and beheaded statues. And I, I, I want us maybe to reflect on what's going on in those moments and those gestures. The image on this slide is, so I believe on Juneteenth this year, which is the anniversary of the date that the Emancipation Proclamation made its way to Texas, well after it was actually proclaimed. So on Juneteenth, the 19th of June this year, two Confederate statues in, in Raleigh in North Carolina were strung up from lampposts and that, of course, is evoking the specter of lynching. So there is a kind of uh, um, a, a drive for some kind of retribution, of course, visited on inanimate objects. So it's, it's important to, 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 to make that distinction. An interesting question for me is why statues have become a terrain for what has actually been a very long running conversation about racial justice and in other contexts, caste justice. And I'll speak briefly about India as well. I think some features of a statue, why statues is, is a question that I found myself thinking about quite a lot. 
and, and maybe this is another way, a different way, I hope a more thoughtful way to bring in a gendered analysis. We often think of statues as phallic objects, and I think we should reflect a little bit more on what that might mean. They overwhelmingly embody men, that's true, and perhaps the description of them as, as phallic is also a reference to their shape, but I think there's much more to it than that. Um, unlike other visual media, a book, a film, a play, a painting, a statue does not ask for your permission. It does not require the consent of the viewer. By virtue of its publicness, it, it, it seems to trust itself upon us without our consent. There is something aggressive about public statues as, as visual artifacts. But precisely because they're public, they stand alone and unguarded in the public sphere, in the agora, they're also quite insecure. So there is a kind of simultaneous aggressiveness and insecurity, which I think makes them magnets for protest. And they're also available as terrains for reinscription in a way that other terrains of history, scholarship, for example, are not, right? So if you have the guts to walk up to a statue and to scrawl graffiti on it, you have an opportunity to quite literally suggest a rewriting of history in a way that you don't um, in, 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 you know, in, on the terrains of scholarship or um, authorized history and, and, and so on. So I think these might be some of the features of statues that have made them magnets for protest in, in the contemporary moment. What about monuments as objects of institutional intervention? So I very much take Susan's point about the, the line between institutions and protesters not being very clear. Institutions have within their ranks people who are quite hospitable to the, to the protests and are in fact perhaps using the protests as opportunities to bring about change that they themselves have long contemplated. But there might be something to say on the other side and, and to, to, to bring this out, I want to draw your attention to a piece that um, is just about to appear in the next issue of Radical Philosophy by a South African writer, Tuli Gametze, um, who works both at the University of Cape Town and the University of Johannesburg. In it, she contrasts the difference between the way in which the statue of Cecil Rhodes was dealt with at the University of Cape Town and the way in which the statues of Colston and the Confederate soldiers that I referenced just a moment ago were dealt with five years later. Direct action, crowds, people taking matters into their own hands quite literally. And as she puts it right in the first lines of the article, she says, you know, when, when I think back to 2015, she expresses a kind of anger that, and I quote, the motherfucker just got airlifted. And she then uses this to think about what the University of Cape Town actually did. It responded very quickly to the demands of Rhodes Must Fall protesters. The statue was removed within a month of the protests. And the institution was then able to say to Rhodes Must Fall, which had named itself after the demand to remove the statue, that's what you've asked for, you've got it, now go back home. So the removal, the institutional removal of the statue was a way to demobilize the movement when in fact the, the demands that it had raised were far more subversive and threatening than perhaps the name of that movement suggested. And so when Roads Must Fall morphed into something bigger, when it became Fees Must Fall, when it became about the political economy of higher education, and when the protests moved outside of the universities of Cape Town, Blitz, Johannesburg, et cetera, to the state, then the response was much more, um, much more aggressive. The use of um, force on university campuses, um, police being called out, private security as well as state police. Um, and you saw the kinds of scenes in Blitz, for example, that uh, protesters are still talking about and, and reading from in a sense. So I guess she's, she's, trying to, she, she's trying to get at the gentrification of decolonization protest when institutions eagerly latch onto them in an attempt to co-opt, demobilize, uh, defang, if you like, the, the initial demands that protesters have, have articulated. Finally, let me say a bit about monuments as counter memory. And I think there's a lot of very interesting stuff to say from India where the, the, the visual politics of the Dalit movement, this is the movement that 
uh, has organized what were formerly known as untouchables, a very sizable proportion of the Indian population, just under 20%. But depending on how you draw the boundaries of identity, you know, these groups also ally with other subordinate caste groups, religious minorities, indigenous people, and under that broader umbrella arguably constitute the majority of the population. So one of the, the, the main um, gestures of iconographic decolonization that you see in India is the building of statues, especially statues of B.R. Ambedkar, who is the foremost leader of the Dalit community. One of Gandhi's fiercest opponents entered into very ferocious disagreements with Gandhi, who he argued, who Ambedkar argued, had very patronizing attitudes towards the caste system. Ambedkar is also important because he became the first law minister of independent India under Nehru and was the chairperson of the drafting committee that put the constitution together. So he's, he's also remembered as a national leader. And so from about the late 80s, early 90s onwards, when Dalit parties began to become more powerful, began to acquire political power in state elections, in provincial elections, you began to see the building of monumental statues of Ambedkar uh, on different scales. I shouldn't say monumental because some of them are actually quite small and can be seen in village squares where the local Dalit community raises money to, to build these statues. But some of them are very large. So this was built in Lucknow, the state capital of Uttar Pradesh, which is, one of the, which is the largest demographically state in India. Uh, and it's a, it's a gigantic monument and it, you know, quite an immense scale, which the picture doesn't do justice to. But what's important about Ambedkar statues is that there are tens of thousands of them. And they, they are in every state of India. You can see them across the country. They do two different kinds of work. First, they occupy space, quite literally. And that's very important because one of the main techniques of caste humiliation was segregation, keeping Dalits out of public space, prohibiting them from using public facilities like water tanks and temples and so forth. And so the statues occupy space. They, they, they literally create space for the community where it was formerly excluded. But they're also symbols of dignity. And so every element of the statue here is important. The book in Ambedkar's hand is, is a copy of the Constitution. The Western suit references his learning in, in Columbia University, New York, and the London School of Economics, uh, and, and sort of portray him as a world figure, a figure of the Enlightenment. The, the outstretched hand is a kind of prophetic gesture, which references his non-secular credentials, actually. He was a late convert to Buddhism, believing towards the end of his life that Hinduism was the problem and a purely secular enlightenment would not deliver the promise of emancipation. And so he was trying to think about what South Asian alternatives existed to Hinduism that might provide the kind of superstructure of beliefs that would, would enable and foster this sense of emancipation. So there's quite a lot going on in the portraiture of the statues themselves. Precisely because these are sites of counter memory, they've also come under attack. So it's not uncommon for Ambedkar statues to be defaced and vandalized by upper caste Hindus. Wow. And precisely because the state governments are either unable or unwilling, more likely, to protect these statues, they have taken to caging them ostensibly for the statue's own protection. But this is obviously also a way to cut down Ambedkar to size, put him back in a box. He's too dangerous. He needs to be contained and tamed and again, defanged in a sense. At the same time, the Hindu right, which is the main ideological opposition to the Dalit movement, upper caste Hindus, and this is now the, the ideological formation that is in power in India in the most overwhelming way. It dominates every institution of politics. This is the government of Narendra Modi, has embarked on a rival statue building spree of its own. So what you see here is currently the tallest statue in the world. It's twice the size of the Statue of Liberty as they're fond of boasting in a lot of their propaganda posters. Uh, it was built at an eye-watering cost that dwarfs the state's budget on housing and all sorts of other things that you might think are more important. Um, it's a statue of the first Home Minister of India, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who's credited with forging the Indian Union in quite a heavy-handed way, coercing, persuading the various princely states to join this new independent country. 
Uh, he's called the Iron Man of India, and he's very much appropriated by the Hindu right as a figure of strong nation state building. So he's sort of the original strong man. And of course, this statue has been built at the expense of vast numbers of local people who've been displaced, many of them indigenous people, on the site of a dam, a massive hydroelectric project that itself displaced many hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. Arundhati Roy wrote a very famous essay about these large scale displacements many years ago. So it's a, it's a statue that also adds insult to injury. It's a very unabashedly supremacist um, artifact that also, I think, sometimes masquerades as a decolonial move. Many of the BJP's and the Hindu rights building projects are justified as acts of decolonization when in fact they masquerade as re-colonial gestures. They're not really protests against British colonialism. They're actually gestures of supremacy vis-a-vis -vis lower castes, Muslims, and other sections of the Indian population that the Hindu right thinks ought to have a subordinate place in the body politic. Um, so I guess, just to conclude, I've been as interested in statue building as demolition. I've been trying to think about racial and caste supremacy and contestation in conversation with each other. And I think there are interesting ways in which those categories could be brought into, into further conversation. Um, and I suppose I wanted to try and broaden the terrain of this discussion beyond Western democratic states and the particular conversations they're having about the afterlives of colonialism to other parts of the world where that are becoming sites of new colonialisms. Uh, that perhaps we should also be talking about. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, I especially like this uh, sort of constitutive ambiguity of the aggressiveness and, and vulnerability or insecurity of monuments in public spaces as they interpolate uh, a variety of publics. And also, of course, thank you for uh, moving us beyond uh, the heartlands of so-called liberal democracy. That's, uh, I think, something that uh, we, we always need to be reminded to, to do a bit more actively. Much of what you say about uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, ostensible gestures of decolonization uh, actually, uh, actually constituting new moments of supremacy uh, rings true in another context that we'll talk about a bit more perhaps later with Banu, uh, Turkey, uh, and the re-consecration, reconversion of Hagia Sophia uh, as a mosque uh, recently, uh, an interesting point of comparison perhaps. Uh, next, we'll move on uh, uh, to Peter Kabachnik, who uh, I want to thank for joining us, especially because it is so early uh, on the other side of the pond uh, in New York. Uh, uh, so thank you, especially for that, uh, for that matter, to all of you who joined us from, from the Americas. Uh, Peter is Professor of Geography in the Department of Political Science and Global Affairs and Coordinator of the Geography Program at the College of Staten Island, uh, City University of New York, and a member of the Graduate Faculty of the Earth and Environmental Sciences Program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He received his PhD in Geography from UCLA, He's a political and cultural geographer whose interests lie in the way that people interact with places and the interplay between place, mobility, and identity more generally. He's currently working on a research project examining the role that personality cults play as a form of social and spatial control in authoritarian regimes. This project explores more broadly how personality cults function, how they act as a disciplinary mechanism, and how they engender practices of conformity and resistance. He also examines the role of cultural memory and memorialized landscapes in shaping national narrative, geopolitical contestations, and people's everyday practices, uh, and is particularly interested in post-Soviet memory and the memorialized landscape in Georgia, focusing on contemporary understandings of Stalin. His previous research has investigated topics such as discrimination against nomadic Roma Gypsy and traveler groups in the UK and the issues facing internally displaced persons in Georgia. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Hold on.
Okay, you guys see that? Yes. Um, so again, thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's great to be here with my fellow panelists and uh, thanks to the, uh, I guess, the Max Planck Institute for holding this uh, excellent uh, and timely uh, discussion. So as uh, Jeremy mentioned, I'm a geographer, so I'm going to always purport the power of place. Uh, and when we're talking about these types of uh, memory battles uh, in public space and what the memorialized landscape looks like, um, I think it becomes uh, uh, very apparent how we have to understand these kind of uh, both banal and spectacular uh, geographies. Uh, I'm going to start off with just talking about um, a little bit uh, about one of my research projects. Uh, that looks at uh, contemporary understandings of um, Soviet symbols uh, in Georgia. And when, uh, so I did uh, 60 uh, qualitative interviews um, a few years back um, and wanted to understand how people uh, negotiated and navigated uh, public space with uh, kind of the vestiges of these Soviet symbols. And I broke it down into kind of three types of symbols, uh, kind of symbols on buildings or architecture like you see here, um, toponyms, uh, street names, and of course, uh, monuments. Uh, and when we're talking about monuments in Georgia, um, uh, and, and Soviet symbols, we, the, the most common uh, debate in, in both political discourse, the media, on the street, uh, is of course uh, talking about Stalin, the Stalin monument. And one Stalin monument in particular, uh, which uh, uh, stands in the city of Gori, which is uh, Stalin's hometown, and is about an hour west of Tbilisi. So this, this Stalin monument, um, uh, survived Khrushchev's de-Stalinization, it survived uh, perestroika, it survived the collapse of the Soviet Union, it survived the civil wars and economic instability of the 90s in Georgia, it survived the Rose Revolution, it survived the Russia-Georgia War, until finally in 2010 it was removed uh, surreptitiously uh, under the cover of night. And it's been, um, so that's just a uh, an image showing that it occupied basically the central public uh, square in this in this city. And this is what it looks like now. And it's been a decade and there hasn't been kind of a final decision as to what will happen to this monument. Will it return? Will it disappear? Uh, will it uh, uh, show up on the grounds of the nearby Stalin Museum inside or outside? Uh, and this has generated quite a bit of debate. And in my research, um, I kind of identify what Alderman refers to as the hybridity of commemoration, right? Um, and this, uh, this is the, the idea that people's perspectives on, on symbols or monuments or public space, what have you, um, are often much more complex and can't be fit into um, kind of neat cate categories, uh, especially that you might find in the media or uh, uh, in policymakers. And these multiple meanings, I think, um, uh, really point to how, uh, how complicated people's relationships are, uh, both with the past, with memory, and, and with the, the symbols they're navigating on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And some of those meanings even include that the monuments don't in fact matter, that they're just stone, uh, and why are people making uh, a big deal about this? And uh, furthermore, because I broke down uh, my research into not just understanding Soviet symbols broadly, but into these kind of particular categories, uh, at first glance, one would see kind of, kind of uh, stark inconsistencies uh, that uh, my interviewees had, uh, where somebody might want to erase all minor little Soviet stars uh, that are, are kind of incorporated into the architecture of, of, of buildings, but would want to keep a giant uh, Stalin monument. Uh, or vice versa. Uh, and again, it just points to show that uh, there's a lot of uh, different reasons depending on where the monument is, what the monument is of, what the form is, uh, whether it depicts a person or not, an individual, typically a man, or, and the size or the monumentality of, of the, of the uh, symbol in question. So all these things uh, uh, have, have a huge role to play. And when we're talking about you know, what to do with this monument uh, in Gori, this is obviously there's a lot of analogies to be made with what's happening uh, in, in, 
with the Confederate memorials in the, in the US. In my, my research, there were alternatives besides tearing down the Stalin monument or keeping it up. Um, and some of those alternatives, and again, these apply also to the Confederate memorials, uh, would be uh, what Foote and Dwyer refer to as symbolic accretion, which is just simply adding uh, extra information, uh, say a small sign or plaque, um, dialogic counter monuments, um, leaving the monument but adding other monuments uh, to be in concert with it and recontextualize it, uh, to moving the monuments, right, uh, to moving them to museums, uh, and to um, the kind of new, uh, new um, uh, thing that people are, are kind of excited about and enthusiastically recommending for these Confederate memorials is to put them in statue parks. And there's a number of, uh, of these statue parks or monument graveyards, if you will, uh, throughout kind of the post-Soviet sphere. Here's one in Moscow. Uh, there's one in Lithuania, uh, in Tallinn. And uh, the kind of the most famous one, the oldest one, is Sober Park in Budapest. And I just want to kind of caution those advocating this as kind of the best solution with what to do with Confederate monuments, because um, as any visitor to these parks will kind of understand that these statue parks can end up a kind of decontextualizing the statues much more than recontextualizing uh, them. Uh, so while the goal might be there's going to be this proper uh, recontextualization um, because these people who are advocating it want to see a thorough engagement with the past, um, a proper reassessment with the, with the historical period in question. Uh, but one may not actually find that in the um, kind of completed uh, statue park. And um, so this is, a, this is a solution that is offer, offered by many commentators. And in a similar way, there are those saying that the US needs to look to the post-Soviet cases for direction. And I wanna kind of push back on this a little bit. Um, while a comparative approach uh, can be helpful, I don't feel this analogy is as pertinent as people presume. Um, instead of saying the US needs to learn from the post-Soviet countries, I think the opposite is the better analogy. Um, what I mean is, let's look at these kind of mega monuments uh, uh, or more conventional nationalist forms of memorialization, uh, such that is occurring in Serbia, Hungary, uh, Russia, as Rahul mentioned, in India. Um, they're actually doing what the white nationalists did in the US and putting up these Confederate monuments post reconstruction from the end of the 19th through to the middle of the 20th century. Um, that was a racialized ethnic nationalism and populism. And this is what we see happening in many places uh, today, um, imbuing the landscape with really kind of particular and exclusive uh, nationalisms. And um, just a quick word about forgetting. Um, those who want the statues to remain, of course, whether Soviet ones or Confederate ones, uh, will say that they don't want to forget, right? Um, but also clearly leaving them up is a kind of forgetting as well, right? So these are relational processes. And um, three kind of, uh, my kind of three key points of emphasis maybe to, I don't know, uh, spur on um, more discussion or just simply to highlight uh, what I, I feel are important ways to approach uh, the question of monuments is first thinking about how we conceptualize them, right? Um, and the first thing I think we need to think about um, is uh, thinking of them as assemblages, right? So instead of seeing them in isolation, right, as these kind of distinct um, cases, I think we need to see them as assemblages. So they're material objects and they're in relation with other material objects and we're in relationship to other monuments. And of course, uh, imbricated and intertwined with uh, social practices. And this um, uh, uh, brings me to kind of also to what Rahul was saying uh, in terms of the roads must fall um, case uh, and Mbembe's uh, essay. Um, uh, when someone kind of proudly pronounces that they want the Confederate statue to, to be up um, because it's their history and history should not be treated that way, they're actually right. 
they're right in the sense that this is the history they are socialized into in the United States, right? That is the curriculum for most students, right? While it's certainly gotten more critical over the decades, it's still uh, nowhere near uh, where I think a lot of us would like it to be. So removing racist symbols from public space needs to be accompanied by the removal of that form of knowledge production from classrooms, from textbooks, from teachers' narratives, right? One cannot successfully decolonize public space without decolonizing the classroom. And without that, white supremacy will continue to stand even if its uh, monuments uh, start to fall. And uh, um, the other uh, aspect, uh, this idea of performativity, right? So monuments aren't just representations. They're not just reflecting social things, right? They're also producing them. And then finally, of course, monuments are effective as well. So we have to kind of think of all these things, I think, in concert. Uh, secondly, um, while I think it's very important to, to, to look at official places of memory, uh, kind of sanctioned places of memory, memory where, I mean, places where memory is designated to be, museums, monuments, etc. Obviously, we need to look at alternative places of memory and um, whether that's, uh, you know, looking at uh, kind of the tree memorial that Jem Jeremy mentioned, uh, thinking of a memorial as a tree, right, is not something I think uh, everyday person kind of thinks about when they think about places of memory. Or, um, uh, alternative sites, just thinking about kind of infrastructure as a, as a, as a type of memory. Uh, as again, Rahul mentioned, just the dam, right? When we're thinking about displacement and ethnic cleansing or dispossession, right? Uh, these these uh, state projects uh, are also places of memory. Um, just again, not the, the ones we typically think of. Um, another example, again, from the US, um, thinking of, um, uh, infrastructure, telephone poles, right? Uh, Eula Biss has a great essay talking about the reception of telephone poles when they first started to, to spread across the country and they were resisted by many people and they were, people were attacked who were putting them up and they were chopped down. And uh, they also had a even more nefarious uh, side uh, and they took, they, they, they were elements in, in lynchings as well. So something that uh, we would see as kind of banal and, and not even notice has this kind of uh, this, this, this memory uh, associated with it as well. And when we're thinking about alternative places of memory, I think we also have to think of the body, right? So the body as a site of memory. And I'll just close with um, this uh, wonderful essay by uh, Carolyn Randall Williams, where she is inserting herself into this um, uh, debate about Confederate monuments in the most kind of embodied fashion by, by claiming her body as a Confederate uh, memorial. And uh, she says, I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the Old South. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monuments, well then, my body is a monument. My skin is a monument. Uh, my very existence is a relic of slavery and Jim Crow. Um, and what is a monument but a standing memory? An artifact to make tangible the truth of the past. Uh, my body and blood are, ta are a tangible truth of the South and its past. The black people I come from were owned by the white people I come from. The white people I come from fought and died for their lost cause. And I ask you now, who dares to tell me to celebrate them? Who dares to ask me to accept their mounted pedestals? And I think um, I'll just stop there and uh, I'm happy to continue this discussion. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm glad you mentioned that Williams essay. Uh, it was published a few months ago, uh, I believe. And uh, I think it's worth uh, for anyone who's interested in these issues at all, really uh, taking a look at the entirety. Uh, I also highly re recommend it. So thank you. It's also interesting to think about the comparison between uh, the post-Soviet, uh, post-communist 
statue parks where the neutralization of the power of the statue is uh, based on the proliferation in a single space of multiple statues. It doesn't make any uh, arithmetic sense at all uh, versus something like the Ambedkar uh, uh, monument that Rahul showed us, which is uh, the attempt to neutralize it is by caging it. And yet that in some sense only highlights its power uh, even more so. So a lot of uh, fascinating things to continue to discuss uh, uh, after uh, in the question and answer period. We'll move now to our final presenter and uh, I'm really uh, excited to introduce her as well uh, and thank, uh, thank her for joining us, Banu Karaja, uh, who works at the intersection of political anthropology and critical theory, art, aesthetics and cultural policy, museums and commemorative practices. Uh, so all of the things that are on our minds today. Uh, her publications interrogate the freedom of expression in the arts, the visualization of gendered memories of war and political violence and visual literacy. She's the author of The National Frame, Art and State Violence in Turkey and Germany, with the, which is forthcoming from Fordham University Press, and a co-editor of Women Mobilizing Memory uh, from Colum Columbia University Press. Banu is currently an EUME fellow at the Volkswagen Foundation at Forum Transregionale Studenin in Berlin. <laughs> Her ongoing research examines how the twin processes of violence and dispossession have shaped understandings of art history and cultural heritage and how they have engendered material and legal modes of forgetting that continue to delimit debates on restitution and historical ju justice. Uh, Banu, uh, I turn it over to you. Hi everybody, um, thank you so much for the warm introduction and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'm sorry I had to turn my camera off because I'm in quarantine uh, since I just arrived in Germany and so if something happens with the with the technology of this, please write me a chat so I'm, I fear I might be speaking into this box for with, that, with you losing me or something. Um, I don't want to, uh, some of the things I wanted to say, the speakers before me have already mentioned. So I'm trying to limit myself to those parts that might perhaps open our discussion even further. Um, as I was looking through the prompts, I, I wanted to, I, I was reminded once again that I think it, it is important to think about monuments within the continuum uh, as embodiments, yes, sometimes of the people they represent in a very real sense, sometimes of certain regimes of power, yes, but they're also part of a larger continuum that brings us from museums to monuments to street names and sometimes even the flag. I'm thinking here of Bree Newsom, for instance, bringing down the con uh, Confederate flag as an intervention exactly at those kinds of points of representation. So, um, when we think about monuments in this matter, I also wonder, and this would be a question for me for the group uh, um, overall, it, to what extent a distinction might still resonate with people that was once very alive, but that I feel has dropped out of a lot of the recent discussions around monuments, which is the differentiation between the, the monument and the memorial. So in classical or in, in the sort of German line of thought, very often the monument is thought of as that um, uh, triumphalist kind of, offering a kind of triumphalist narrative, very much in the sense of this extended image of the phallic uh, symbolism that Rahul has, has uh, uh, sketched for us already. Whereas memorials very often are thought of ideally as as invitations to more open-ended works of mourning and commemoration. And to what extent that makes, might make sense um, is perhaps an issue. This kind of differentiation might make sense. Not that I want to sort of salvage one over, over the other, one or the other, but does it make sense to think about this current moment also in those kind of terms? Because I think some of the, what we would say, counter memorials that are being currently proposed 
uh, in Turkey over the past few years, now many of them demolished. In Germany, for instance, we're seeing uh, initiatives, uh, more recent initiatives like the Memorial for Victims of Racist Violence, that along with uh, the very long-standing groundwork of, of advocating for the removal of racist and colonialist monuments has sort of been, been a focal point, both in terms of the desire for such a monument and the kind of um, uh, vulnerability these monuments exhibit. For instance, this monument, which is, has been erected in and Hermann Platz has been, for the memory of uh, victims of racist violence, has been defaced numerous times since its very uh, relatively short lifespan. I'm also wondering, as I was looking through the call that you made to us, I'm also wondering if what kind, how we want to think about these days, about notions like iconoclasm, for instance. Because iconoclasm, when we look historically, is always accorded to those not in power, right? So to what extent is iconoclasm actually a, um, a useful concept? Um, let's, uh, I mean, the, the most on the nose, perhaps, example of this is the removal of the uh, statues of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. They were never, uh, of course, internationally talked about as iconoclastic actions uh, at any point in time. So um, maybe I could, um, it, it depends a little bit what the interest is of the group in terms of what we're talking about. I'd be happy to give some examples also from the Turkish context and perhaps one thing that I want to come back to because it's not been talked about so much is this question of the invisibility of the monument. And here I think there's, a, there's an interesting slippage in Musel's uh, much cited proposition. Because what, what I always read it as and what, what I've worked on with different groups of uh, students, for instance, is not that the monument is invisible in terms of a regime of seeing that it's imperceptible, but rather that the invisibility derives from the dominant kind of narratives and power relations. So um, if any of you have been to Istanbul, um, I'm sure you've been to Taksim, and Taksim is very much described, or anyone who meets at ta in Taksim meets in relation spatially somewhere to the monument. There's a, and whenever I asked, when I was teaching in Istanbul, groups of students, if they knew the monument, everyone would say yes. If you ask them what the monument was depicting, everyone would be at a complete loss sort of people would remember like perhaps a detail or a figure, but they all knew what the monument was about, that it was a monument to the Republic. That's a different story. But it's actually the aesthetic details of it or the artistic positions or what was expressed there was a was in some ways almost unnecessary. It, the, the monument as such tells such a dominant story that the details in that case don't don't, didn't even matter. And the details only matter when there are, I think, a large, um, when there is a large scale mobilization or a forceful mobilization, grassroots mobilization against these kind of monuments and what they actually stand for and what stand for, not just in terms of representation, but also what they sort of present to us, to everyone who passes um, as legitimate kinds, forms of power and subjugation. Um, and I think in that way, Musa's proposition of the invisibility is an important one exactly because it is only in moments of crisis, it is only in moments when uh, anti-racist, for instance, activists mobilize and they've been mobilizing for years. I, I'm thinking in the German context of the many, many uh, uh, amazing uh, post-colonial history groups who are addressing locally and nationally colonial German histories or tear this down, for instance, which is an interactive map 
of uh, colonial and racist monuments in Germany that's trying to work towards um, the dismantling of such monuments and statues, uh, till, uh, including street names um, as well. So um, perhaps since I know, Jeremy, you had sort of mentioned a few times uh, sort of the Turkish context um, or perhaps that examples from there might be of interest, um, you know, and I think what we see is, and we've seen this for some time, there's been a lot of books on memorial wars and museum wars and the drive of these kind of uh, production of narratives. And I think uh, it's very interesting. It's not just that there's a mobilization against racist colonialist monuments within the European context or the US, of course, in a, in a very different way, or, but connected. But there's at the same time a struggle over memory overall. When we think about what's going on in Germany right now, um, there's a monument, monument and museum re being rebuilt in the form of the Humboldt Forum, which is the resurrection of a Prussian castle, which was uh, destroyed in World War II, right? So and in that, and now we having layers upon layers um, and it was the palace of the republic for the east german uh, state and that was then torn down and now being resurrected as a prussian castle which bears the name humboldt which will now show collections um, that used to be formerly in ethnographic museums or in dalem uh, the provenance of which is highly debated to put it mildly and um, all this also goes on the back, sort of another layers on layers upon forgetting and trying to lead, uh, re legitimize uh, illegitimate collections um, at a time where so much of this history is contested, is I think really sort of one of the focal points where we, a lot of these issues crystallize. Um, there's much more to say about all of this, but I don't want to overstretch my time. But these would be sort of some of, of my um, answers towards the prompts that uh, you, Jeremy, and your group have sort of put together for us to start a conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Banu. Uh, it was indeed a, a collective effort, I should emphasize again. I'm glad you brought up the topic of iconoclasm uh, because it gestures toward a question we haven't really raised in the prompts either, which is the sort of taken for granted secularity of people's relationships to statues and monuments nowadays. Uh, and of course, we don't have to go uh, too far afield to come up with counterexamples. Most uh, famously perhaps in recent years, the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I also uh, appreciate your mentioning of Pietro Canonica uh, in Taksim Square because that's a monument that I also write about a bit. Uh, and it makes me think about the miniature of that monument in the uh, miniature park at uh, Minya Turk in uh, Istanbul. Miniature monuments are yet another, uh, I guess this was part of the, uh, the, the sixth uh, thematic in a way. Uh, with Isaac Cordal, but uh, the sort of miniaturization, Susan uh, Stewart's work comes to mind on miniatures there. Uh, I think now would be a wonderful time to allow our, uh, our speakers to respond briefly to anything that might uh, have come up uh, uh, in the conversation, and then we'll, uh, we'll have questions after that. So we can take the same order, I think. Uh, Susan, do you have uh, some, some thoughts to share? Well, um, I have more of a question, and it's for Rahul uh, and your very interesting presentation. It's actually less about the representation of the facts than about the facts, but you said two things. Well, one thing in particular that surprised me, I, you know, my knowledge of Indian politics is, I mean, it's not complete ignorance, but it's limited. Um, but I understood two things differently from what you said, namely um, in, in the things that I have read, namely that the BJP, had, one of the reasons for their success is that they've actually managed to co-opt a number of uh, people in the Dalit community. And you were re representing them as being absolutely, um, you know, in favor of 
the hierarchies and the oppression of the Dalits. So, so I just wondered if you could clarify that and also talk about the tension between Amritkar and uh, Gandhi and how you see, whether you see those reproaches as fair or not. I realize it's about the, the history rather than the monuments to the history, but you made me very curious. Sure. Shall I uh, respond to that, Jeremy, right now? Um, on the first question, you're absolutely right. The BJP has masterfully co-opted uh, Dalit and subordinate caste communities or fractions of them, has peeled away some sections of these communities in order to craft its electoral majority. And the way it's done this is by, is by raising the specter of the Muslim invader. So it's tried to, to, to weld these groups into a refashioned Hinduism that is less insistent on a caste hierarchy um, and um, claims to, to represent these groups that hitherto were not represented by the Hindu right. How successful it's been, I think this is still a fight and these coalitions are shifting and they're by no means, they're, they're too new to have sedimented into uh, sort of permanent formations. So this describes the last couple of elections. Uh, but I think the, the Dalit leadership is still very acutely aware. I mean, from their point of view, this is a danger. It's, it's, a, it's a very immediate electoral danger that they're, that they're keenly aware of. Whether this means the BJP has now taken an anti-caste position is a separate question, because I think they can play this kind of electoral politics while still holding on to, uh, in a very strong sense, a notion of caste as central to Hinduism and Hindu belief as an ingenious Hindu mechanism for reconciling unity and diversity and so on and so forth. So I'm not, I'm not sure that this kind of instrumentalist electoral politics has necessarily changed their views on the caste system in a, in a sort of deep idealist sense. And the, the debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar is very much one at the level of ideals. Gandhi, although his views on caste shifted, I think throughout his life had a very patronizing view of what it would take to improve the position of Dalits. It was very much about changing upper caste sensibilities and persuading the upper caste to engage in a kind of benevolent project of upliftment, which Ambedkar and the Dalits thought was patronizing. It, it seemed to rely too much on upper caste largesse rather than lower caste mobilization. And, you know, in his worst moments, Gandhi was apt to make excuses for the caste system, not, not even see it as a problem, but sort of suggest that it was the superior institution, superior to, say, the American race problem, a superior institution for reconciling communities and welding them together into a single formation, even if a hierarchical one. Um, there's a big debate that opens up between them in the 20s and 30s, and it also has implications for political representation. Ambedkar was very much for separate representation of Dalits. Gandhi wanted them to be considered Hindus, um, in part because he believed that if the Hindus could wield a, a numerical majority, they would have a, be in a much stronger position. So yeah, I, and that debate is still alive, I think, in a sense, although there are very few Gandhians left in Indian politics today. Thank you. Rahul, uh, would you like to uh, pose any other questions or sure. share any other thoughts before we move on to Peter? I, I just wanted to pick up on Banu's uh, comments about iconoclasm. And I think the distinction between the iconoclasm of those who are in power versus that of those who feel unrepresented in the public sphere is, is a very important one. And if we were to pay attention to that distinction, then I think we would not hear the kind of facile equations that we sometimes hear where say roads must fall is equated with the Taliban or ISIS in the kind of you know public discussion that, that we sometimes hear. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was uh, monuments is invisible, perhaps not just monuments as invisible, which is interesting. I have less to say about that, but I'm also interested in monuments to be invisible what kinds of memorials we're, we're thinking about or building around the memory of those whom we know to have existed, but about whom we know very little as individuals, whether that's the enslaved or the disappeared, or um, I, I'm interested in the way in which 
we have to we have to go beyond figural representation when we think about these kinds of absences that we want to make visible and present. So more of a comment than a question, maybe. Thank you. I, I think that also resonates with one of the themes that uh, I wanted to highlight, but failed to do so as clearly, or we wanted to highlight and failed to do so as clearly as we might have. Namely, you know, what are the limitations of figuration and what other forms of memorialization, if not monumentalization, are possible? Uh, Peter, would you like to offer a few thoughts or questions, perhaps? Um, sure. Uh, I don't know if this is the perfect venue, but in my, for my own research, it's interesting if uh, Banu could speak a little bit about the role of Ataturk's uh, uh, monuments in public space and how Erdogan is, uh, is, 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 is contending with that and how the public uh, is, the multiple publics are, are aligning with, uh, with what Ataturk uh, represents in the, in the current uh, political uh, regime. And um, maybe just another comment or question, um, or again, just something to think about, something that, um, that Susan mentioned in terms of um, uh, monuments uh, having, uh, having a role of, of memorializing values, right? Um, and I think this is how monuments were kind of seen um, by, uh, by scholars and, and, and by uh, politicians uh, for quite some time as having uh, uh, what J.B. Jackson uh, called the a hortatory uh, function, right? It's not just a representation, right? But it's, um, it's kind of um, a model, right? It's about modeling behavior or modeling values, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's, and it's kind of uh, has a, a future element to it, right? Uh, this is how things should be. Uh, so it's really kind of about this, uh, a much more uh, active social order um, reproduction, which I think is, is interesting and sometimes gets lost uh, in how monuments uh, are thought about in terms of seeing them kind of more just about explanation, uh, providing some information uh, rather than kind of building on these bigger ideals. Um, I'll stop there. Great. Uh, I think uh, that's does dovetail to Bono a bit, though uh, Susan also uh, perhaps has a response. Uh, but Bono, do you want to? Uh... Um, I can just, you know, I mean, the, the, the Peter, as you might imagine, you know, um, when we talk about monuments in Turkey or, you know, there's a lot of uh, people here that I had, uh, that I did the class together on museums and monuments in Atatürk is of course its own uh, sort of life force but we very often also look to the post-socialist examples uh, in that context and I think the Atatürk statue within the Turkish context sort of distills many of the problems problematics that uh, monuments bring with them uh, just to give a few uh, sort of keywords or key themes. The problem, of course, with discarding, uh, what you find out when you try to discard Atatürk statues is that the likeness of Atatürk is um, protected by law. So putting him in the trash is an offense. So this has led to all kinds of bizarre um, practices in terms of what to do with these statues. Uh, we have the same problem, of course, very often with flags, I think, in an international context as well. Um, but of course, this, this sort of one-to-one -one embodiment uh, that sometimes is, is being propagated in Turkey or sometimes does its work too, has also, of course, made the figure of Mustafa Kemal into uh, a vehicle for political mobilization by individuals who go there and, you know, publicly uh, complain about the current government uh, to this figure, uh, to people who sort of kidnap the figure of Mustafa Kemal and hold a gun to the head of the monument and so on, where this kind of embodiment works in a way to make a lot of different political claims and political performativity, um, which I think, you know, in the socialist context, you have 
probably abundantly as well, but the post-socialist context has exactly, and you can speak perhaps more about that, has really also brought about a lot of uh, ideas around, I mean, you were saying, you know, who should we look at as a model, but I do find this, these kind of monument parks quite interesting in that way, right? Um, where do statues die? We still don't know, you know, where do they go to die exactly? Uh, or do, do they really die there? Or do they be, really have a chance to have a second life that's more productive? And uh, that speaks to, to sort of larger parts um, of the populace. I'm not sure. I mean, this is certainly something we can talk about um, in more detail. But Susan, I'm sure, also might want to answer before oh. she needs to be going. Yeah, well, I do need to go in a couple of minutes. But no, I, I, I don't have anything um, particular to say about Peter, except, um, you know, look, I am a philosopher. so. Um, so I have absolutely no um, hesitation in talking about values um, rather than rep representation. And, and uh, I just think it's very important to remember we don't eat to, uh, today or in the past, we don't build monuments to every piece of our history. Um, and, uh, you know, we pick and choose and we pick and choose according to um, you know, the values that a community at a particular time is enshrining and wants its children to grow up honoring. And, um, and I, 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 don't, I don't see any serious difference in time. I mean, Jeremy brought up the Stolpersteine as a possible counterexample, but um, I would simply say the, the Stolpersteine rep represent the idea that a German, the German nation should take responsibility for its victims and not only for its victories. And moreover, that it should be, it should force people to remember that the crimes committed in its name didn't just take place in Poland or somewhere on the outskirts, but that they began exactly in the neighborhoods where people live and, you know, go to the dentist or the grocery store today. And that that's, um, that's something that needs, needs to be remembered once again, so nothing similar happens in the future. So I just, I don't, I don't see an interesting difference in terms of timing or form. I think um, all monuments are messages um, that attempt to get people to commit to particular values. Uh, so if I'm understanding what Peter was saying, um, that's my answer. But maybe I misunderstood you, Peter. Did I understand you? I, I thought you did until you said the last thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, all I was saying is that um, I think there are some types of monuments um, that don't uh, aim to, like, explicitly are aiming not to fulfill that role anymore. And I'm not saying that that should be the role of monuments or not, just that that, that switch has happened a little bit. That's Could you I'm give saying. me an example of such a monument? Uh, some people would say uh, initially Gettysburg was clearly about ideals, and then it became just simply explaining troop movements and a very kind of distillation of kind of banal information and uh, kind of dampening down the values. Now, Gettysburg is still a very kind of central, kind of sacralized uh, um, historical event, but just just a, tr a trend towards description or explanation rather than uh, broader ideals, maybe. Okay, I'll... It's been a very long time since I've been to Gettysburg, so I can't... Um... I can't check that. Yeah. <laughs> um, not from Berlin at the moment, anyway. Um, I'll have to think whether it applies to any. I mean, so here's something that was built quite recently, by the way, the, the Memorial Park at Vicksburg uh, in Mississippi. I don't know if you ever saw that, um, which is uh, it's an, it's an extraordinary, huge monument to the Confederacy. And it was built in the 70s. 
And, you know, there's an explanation at the beginning talking about, uh, you know, sort of a dig at the Yankees. Well, the South was destroyed uh, after the Civil War, so we didn't have the money to build the kind of monuments that the Yankees did, which of course is completely false, as we know, that most of the monuments were built, the funds were raised by the, the Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, but it's, it's, it was a jaw-dropping, huge, set of, of monuments very much in this old fashioned, um, I mean, not, you know, by the seventies, no, it was the, the valor, I was trying to, I'm trying to see if, if anything was softened in the, um, you know, in the, in the idealization of the Confederate figures, but it wasn't really. I mean, it was the valor and the nobleness and the tragedy and the heroism and all of that stuff. So um, I, uh, um, yeah, I would, I, would say, I would say for the Confederate monuments, of course, it, that, that values would be uh, uh, dominant. But for Gettysburg, which was the point was about national reconciliation for at least uh, a, a portion of white Americans, right? You want to downplay rubbing it in to the Confederacy that they lost, and it's more kind of a more neutral, maybe. Well, I don't think this is nitpicking to say yeah. that was an ideal too. That oh, yeah. you know, uh, you yeah, know, uh, definitely initial. Initially, that's an ideal. When I'm saying over the years, Gettysburg becomes more about uh, you know military buffs going to learn about troop movements. Uh, so that that becomes, I, I, again, Gettysburg, I shouldn't have used Gettysburg as an example because it is such a central part of the Civil War. But I think there is a, a, a trend towards that kind of uh, memorialization, which doesn't line up with its initial. Uh, okay. I, I mean, I would need to need to have some more examples. But yeah. um, unfortunately, I have a doctor's appointment. So um, I will say goodbye. Thanks to all of you. Pleasure to talk to you. And um, sorry, I'm going to miss the end of this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Pleasure. And, and yeah, please, Banu, please. And then Rahul also. Oh, so Rahul, just go ahead. Okay. I, I, I guess I, I, I think this conversation is very interesting because I mean, the point about values is values change, right? And right. I mean, the, the, the thing about statues is they don't. We're stuck with these built environments that are very difficult to right. take. A statue is a bid for immortality. It's built precisely in order to prevent future generations from changing their minds too easily. And right. I think this move towards gigantism and ever bigger and heavier and larger monuments, which Susan was also referencing, is in a way a, a way of binding future generations against the kind of value change that mm -hmm. perhaps all generations are very anxious about. Um, you know, they're anxious about their their, their, their future memories. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, well, their future. Yeah, values. Their future commitments. Moral commitments. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. All right, I gotta go. Um, bye. Unless Banu, did you have a question directly for me, or was it for somebody else? <laughs> No, I mean, it's connected to that, Susan, but I hate to keep you if you have to well, run, but like I, yeah, let me just say, I, I understand, um, um, I, I mean, you've already laid out for us as, as a philosopher, you feel very much uh, not uh, shy about addressing values, but I would like to sort of insist a little bit further on this thing. I wonder if monuments, I'm not talking about memorials who do a work of mourning. I wonder if monuments are indeed about values. They're very often legitimized by referring to values, especially when they come into question right, as we have seen with Confederate monuments, where it's often has been said when they have been criticized, that they are perhaps not, it's not so important, you know, it's more important that what, what actually happens, they are, you know, they were patriots in their own way. They defended freedom in their own way. Um, these are, you know, values that freedom is something, you know, I think as a value we can all, 
you can mobilize a lot of consent around that. But I do wonder if monuments, the form of the monument, exactly in the way Raoul has said, in this sort of ossification that they materially present, are indeed about values or about a certain way of telling history. But the certain way of telling it is according to certain values. We want not, to believe that patriotism looks like this. And we want to, you know, set that in stone so that, I mean, as Raul said, so that future generations will not question the idea that patriotism is this thing and represented by this person. I don't, I don't see that. I do see it. I do. I would say there's a difference between this. I don't think that exactly because these values are changeable and because I think this is about certain ways of inscribing power that rely on certain narratives of the past. I'm not, I understand your point. I just find it very, I would find it interesting to further sort of tease out how this works in conjuncture with each other. You know, because we can also say about Bismarck, I mean, this is the story now in Germany, what kind of figure is Bismarck and what kind of values does Bismarck represent? And, you know, that brings us down a very... Um, it's but a, that's the problem. The problem with, with Bismarck is that he represents, uh, you know, a complicated set of values, most of which we want to do away with, we want to abhor today. But I mean, it isn't simply that he's this historical man who for some reason, uh, you know, certain groups of people have decided they don't want to honor, they don't want to honor the values that he stood for. That's why it's controversial. So of course values change, you know, I'm someone who believes in moral progress. Um, and I think the, the uh, discussions we've been having about monuments in the last, you know, half year in particular, but, but you know, for quite some time, I think those are examples of moral progress. Um, but, um, okay, I'm sorry, I really do have to go now and I'm sorry I can't stay to, to um, have, this, uh, have this discussion further. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Another time, hopefully. Yes. Uh, I, I think uh, it might be, uh, uh, now that we bid goodbye to Susan, it might be time to turn to some questions and comments from the audience, if that's okay. Peter, I did see that you were raising your, your, your literal uh, and not digital hand. <laughs> there are so many different ways to signal here. Um, uh, but I, was just wave, I was waving goodbye. Oh, you were waving goodbye, aha. Uh -huh. Uh, right. <laughs> we can also wave our digital hand, of course. Uh, but Artem, uh, I believe, uh, you had a, a question and a comment. Is that right? Yes. And I'll just remind everyone, too, to let me know either privately or otherwise if you have a question, and, and I'll just uh, call, call to you. So Artem Galushko. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much, first of all, for the very interesting and uh, thought-provoking presentations. I have uh, a question and a brief observation about the similarities of the memory politics in the United States and in the former Soviet Union. So, for instance, there are some similarities in discussions about monuments in the U.S. and in my home country, Ukraine, where more than 500 um, Lenin monuments were toppled just in one year. And the similarities do not mean that the histories of the US and the communist countries are somehow comparable. Of course, they are not. But the similarity is related to the memory work, how the memory works. And in my opinion, in both cases, the memorialization is often promoted as the main instrument in reconciliation. For example, the mayor of New Orleans once proposed exchanging the monuments uh, to the Confederacy for more inclusive monuments. And people in uh, many post-Soviet states often ask uh, themselves the very same question, whether many monuments can be truly inclusive. After all, monuments uh, commemorate events and historical figures that are often controversial, both at home and abroad. And in this context, I wanted to, um, to come back to this argument about the cultural heritage, which is often used by those who defend Confederate monuments and old communist monuments um, and for example, when all arguments are exhausted, these people say, look, these are painful pages of our history, but we, can, we cannot remove these uh, painful pages of history simply by removing the monuments. So would you argue that some monuments do not belong to the common culture simply because 
this monuments violate certain principles that are important and valuable for a given society. Uh, thank you. Oh. Sorry, I had to run out for a moment. Uh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I can repeat my question if it is necessary, Jeremy. No, no, I, I heard, but uh, would anyone like to take it up? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I agree. I think there are uh, definitely parallels and with, with, you, with uh, the memory work going on in Ukraine. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of layers in Ukraine. We have the kind of the Lenin monuments in light of kind of the geopolitics with Russia. And then you have this is the Bandera monuments, uh, you know, so you have all these different uh, and again, very recent uh, uh, forms of, uh, of memorial memory work. Um, just in terms of your question, if I can, uh, if I understood it, uh, I think um, despite the goal of monuments to be this, these kinds of things that anchor identity, uh, you know, forever, right? We know that they don't, <laughs> right? So, um, so yeah, I, I think if it's, it's the way, right, one of the debates about monuments is the way uh, monuments are removed. Is it happened through institutions and is there a democratic and public debate about it? Uh, is it decisions by elites? Is it the crowd coming and toppling it? You know, how, do, how does it happen? And we can have opinions on that. But I think, um, you know, if there is something that seems to have been, you know, part of the common culture and now people, more people are upset about it than not, um, I think it can be abandoned and perhaps even should be. Um, but how that process uh, occurs, that becomes the trickier part in terms of the politics of, of, of what goes there and what, and what, what doesn't. And then that, I think, ties into kind of one of the broader questions uh, for, for this uh, webinar. Um, you know, what, what, what is the future of monuments? Do we need monuments? Right, that I think is a more interesting question. Why, you know, you can talk about the distinction Banu made between memorials and monuments, right? We can memorialize things, but do we need to monumentalize them? Right, so that's, uh, you know, it's not about invisible monuments or tiny monuments or these playful things. I think we can think about monuments. Do we do we need? How about non monuments, right? <laughs> uh, and then we can look at an alternative kind of uh, uh, everyday uh, landscape. That that what does that look like? Um, uh, and that would be, I think, difficult to imagine uh, because of the nation state system and how much it relies on uh, on that. Can I maybe just jump in on this question as well? Um, yes, of, yes, of course. Uh, then we have at least two more waiting in the queue, but uh, please, Rahul. Very briefly, I know a little bit more about the US side than the Soviet side, but I think one response to the cultural heritage argument would be to point out that, so in the case of many of these Confederate statues, they weren't built soon after the Civil War. They were built 50 years or 100 years later uh, in the context of very specific political things happening in those moments. So the statue of Robert E. Lee, many of the statues of Robert E. Lee are not monuments to 1861 to 65 necessarily. They're almost more truthfully described as monuments to 1910 or 1955 or something like that. And so then you've got to ask the question, what cultural heritage are you preserving? What, what history are you reminding the viewer of? And I think maybe this points us to the possibility that Statues and monuments actually have multiple times, right? There's the time of the event that they're referencing, the time in which they're built, the time in which you and I are looking at them and arguing about them. Um, and all of these times have to be acknowledged in a sense in recognizing what makes the statue controversial at the time that it becomes so. So maybe that's a way of complicating this simple cultural history, preservation of cultural history argument. And I, I think just to pick up on that a bit, uh, and also in relation to the question about values uh, or the conversation about values that was ongoing when Susan had to leave, it strikes me that uh, Musil's invisibility of monuments might most apply to those moments at which the values that are understood to be embodied in a monument and the values of a sort of context more broadly are uh, 
are uh, transparent to each other. And it's when there's that uh, dissonance between values uh, at, at one moment in time and those that are taken to have been embodied in the past in the monument that, that these controversies arise. Um, and of course, there's a question as to how flexible the stories told about monuments can be in order to reinterpret them for the present. So Confederate monuments supporters will say things like states' rights or freedom, and that rings hollow now when we think of them as merely white supremacy, which indeed uh, was, uh, for the most part, the values that they embodied in the first instance. But in any case, uh, we should move on to a couple of other uh, audience members. Uh, Mora, uh, I know you had a comment. Well, actually, hi, everybody. Rahul actually sort of said in a certain sense what I was thinking. I mean, I, I grew up in New York, but I've lived in Virginia for 20 years. And I think it's really important to recognize that these are monuments, most of them built during the lost cause, built as monuments to the, lo to the lost cause. They're not built at the time. The other thing that I think I wanted to just add in just for us to think about is the funding in terms of public statues and how that that has an impact because one of the big questions in Richmond now has been the fact that some of these um, monuments that they're taking down or the plinth or part of it has actually been funded by um, what were essentially African American groups that um, at the time were saw that as a way of participating in mainstream society. I'm not making any value judgment on that. I'm just suggesting it as a question that we wanna think about in terms of public funding. And of course that also comes from the work I've done on the Habsburg Empire, right? On who built the Sisi statues um, and who, who paid for those. It was not, it, it, was, the, it was a popular movement for most Sisi statues right and and yet she's uh she's the empress so um i think it's just something i wanted to introduce wait it wasn't romy schneider <laughs> no, sorry a bad joke um uh thank you would anyone like to respond uh, to mora among the panelists It was more of a, a comment and uh, uh, well put. Uh, it reminds me too of the rather strange story of the pedestal uh, of the Statue of Liberty, which apparently the American government refused to uh, pay for. Uh, the statue itself was of course uh, funded by uh, various folks in France, but then Joseph Pulitzer uh, had a campaign in his newspaper <laughs> to fund the pedestal, which apparently people were sending in their pennies, and it's all very romanticized now, of course. Uh, Yelena, you had a question, I believe. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm asking this after Susan Iman had to leave, because, because it actually starts with um, a statement that she made in an interview, um, and she has a very optimistic view, I think, about the values um, that the monuments are to embody, as we heard. And she made a statement that monuments, they actually, statues, they do something for the community. They have sort of a cohesive uh, force by embodying the values that is, that is doing some work for the community and that, that they are necessary, that they will be necessary, and that what we basically need to have is more better heroes um, to embody truth in the statues. But actually, um, now moving on to uh, an article that uh, Rahul Rao wrote that was extremely interesting about how even the uh, uh, figures that are very important post-colonial figures um, in a changing geopolitical situation and due to other changes in context can actually be toppled or in some way replaced. How can we now, coming back to the question from our um, first, I think, invitation to this event is, how then are we to proceed? How could we, how could we in the future um, make better practices or of memorialization? And can we, or is it always going to be, uh, there is always be work to be needed to be done, um, something very soon. That's a great question. And I guess you're referencing the piece I wrote about the Gandhi must fall protest in Accra, which briefly the protesters were very, very opposed to this installation of a Gandhi statue in, on their campus because they said Gandhi was a racist and they pointed to a lot of his statements that he made 
when he lived in South Africa about black South Africans. They pointed to his caste beliefs, which I was discussing earlier. And interestingly, they also pointed to the way in which Africans are treated in Indian cities today, the kind of everyday racism to which they're subject, um, as a way of saying, why should we be kowtowing to this new emerging superpower that treats us so badly in its own country at a time like this? Um, so I think it was, it was about Gandhi, certainly, but it was also about the shifting position of India in the African imaginary, which again, just like values shift, power shifts as well. And that also reshapes our view of the symbols of that power um, in, in a very immediate way. For me, it suggests that although statues are a bid for immortality, in fact, nothing is forever. And it makes me wonder about whether we can cultivate a more ephemeral, this goes back to Peter's question about do we need statues anymore? Or if we do have statues, what would ephemeral, shifting, provisional statue building look like? Uh, one example that comes to mind is maybe the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square where the artifact changes every few months. It sort of institutionalizes a kind of permanent temporariness, if that makes sense. Um, it doesn't go beyond statue building and that plinth stands alongside three other plinths that have very classical colonial statues but it does create a different, um, a different dialogue that keeps changing as, as the exhibit changes. It's just one example, but I'd be curious about more provisional ways of thinking about statues that were more dynamic. I believe it was uh, the artist Anthony Gormley who had a whole series of he invited a whole variety of, uh, well, Londoners and others to spend an hour on the plinth, uh, the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, and then created, uh, of course, a kind of monumental book <laughs> about it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Gormley is very interesting because you, you, I think it was W.J.T. Mitchell who wrote an essay on Gormley and said that, you know, for about a hundred years, the human body has kind of fallen out of fashion in abstract sculpture. And Gormley is actually the person who brings the body back, at least in British sculptural practice. So he's, yeah, he's an interesting figure because in some sense, you know, he is looking to the future in the way you described, but he's also reviving something that had fallen out of fashion before. Well, this also, I, uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience at the moment, and we're actually nearing our time. Anyhow, though, we're at liberty to stay a bit longer. I know you have to leave Rahul uh, very soon, but this is sort of the, the key uh, question that I have to, to interventions such as Kahinde Wiley's uh, rumors of war, you know, in, in these sort of counter monuments that embody the very aesthetics of the hegemonic monuments that they're meant to counter, sort of what is the limitation of that gesture uh, as opposed to something uh, more ephemeral uh, such as uh, that which you're discussing. So I don't have any answers to it. It's more just a sort of question. Banu, please. Yeah, I think, you know, in, especially with Holocaust memory in the German context, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, well, at the time when the memorial for the uh, murdered Jews of Europe was built in Berlin, there were a lot of other kinds of proposals, including Renata Stich and Frieda Schnock's proposal for a bus station that would uh, bring uh, people to concentration camps nearby for instance, you know, also an ephemerality or not, not sort of materialness, but rather uh, enabling commemorative visits. Um, uh, and I think there's a lot of creative solutions for that, disappearing monuments or memorials. But I think, I think we will find over and over again these very creative and innovative um, responses, I think. And I think that's the important thing, that, that there are these responses and there is some, there is um, an interest and perhaps a need, an effective attachment to commemoration in these different forms. And one example that always stuck in my mind that I, I was fascinated by in 2013, where the Gezi protests in Istanbul, where one of the first actions that people undertook 
was the commemoration of victims from the Armenian genocide to victims of recent political violence in Turkey within the park. And this was instantaneous with the occupation in the park, this kind of commemorative practice happened. Um, those memorials were, of course, um, removed. They do not exist uh, anymore. Uh, but um, yeah, but I think there's this there are these responses and the question is less uh, do we need monuments or not but rather it will be i think how how do stakeholders how do we, we respond together to these um, events that want to be remembered that different communities care about and sort of how will the stakeholders decide you know because there is i think there is a lot of work around these ephemeral um, initiatives. However, because they are in competition with this very much ways of seeing that are in, in sort of ingrained in the nation state form and its monumental regimes, it's always a bit of a difficult, I think, um, comp not competition, but it's a, diff it's a, it's a difficult terrain um, in that those practices then uh, tread, it seems to me. No, absolutely. Uh, I'm reminded again, uh, you know, Susan has left the co conversation, but one of the reasons I wanted, uh, I wanted to sort of meditate a bit on the Stolpersteine, the, the stumbling stones. For those of you who are not familiar with the, the German context, these are small actual metal uh, installations on the sidewalk that commemorate specific places where Holocaust victims uh, lived or in some cases uh, where, uh, where they were taken from. Uh, and comparing that to the, the Holocaust Memorial in, uh, in Berlin, you know, it's a very different kind of temporality and intervention that doesn't necessarily presuppose the nation state way of seeing in the same way. It interrupts your daily life and, and makes you question what happened there. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, Chichek, I believe uh, you have uh, uh, something to add. Sorry, I'm just going to have to say goodbye now because I, I have to leave. But thank you very much for a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, be well. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much for all the presentations. It's a pity that I just jumped in after Raul left. But I was wondering if, like, that was one of our motivations when we started first to talk about this uh, workshop, just following up Yelena's point. And I was wondering if it is possible to take this turn, the moment, this particular moment of critique, as a critique on temporality of public monumentalization. Like, would, would you agree that it is some sort of, the, the whole critique is based on what, like, as we talked about values, let's follow that, like, that line of thought, although, I don't think it's merely about values, but it's more about power. So might it be about, like, can we think about a hopeful turn in terms of thinking of statues, especially and public monuments in general, towards a different temporal regime? Does it suggest, can we say that what is going on now suggests a different temporal understanding of public monumentalization? Thanks. I have some thoughts on that, Chichek, but I would prefer for Bondo or Peter or a few others, uh, uh, anyone else really who would like to, 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 to join the conversation. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I also would like to hear what Peter has to say, but I'm also uh, running a little bit on the um, short end of things. I, I do wonder about this. I think that temporality is very much, and, and I don't know how, how um, for instance, Peter, you are thinking about this in your work. Temporality is an issue that we're very much attached to at the moment, which also makes me very suspicious. As much as I'm also questioning this line, mm -hmm. I also find this, I always think that when we tend to sort of go towards a conceptualization that seems to bring us out of our current predicament, the question is always, why this? And I think um, that, while the ephemerality, the, the, the sort of better suitedness of ephemeral um, 
kinds of commemoration have been stressed, I think, for quite some time now. I also want, like, I, I sort of sometimes think if I was able to experience a long durée of that, if we would come out on the other side again in favor of more static kind of monuments, right? So I think that the question of temporality is both uh, comes out of the history of the monument itself, but also says something very specific about the moment that we're in and a certain kind of insecurity I think we're experiencing for good reason for very good reason. Um, but I think we also have to stay at that uncomfortable point of what is the reason for that and what kind of futures or non-futures does it pro project in a, in a way. You know, and I'm seeing this also uh, as in your intervention, also in Yelena's, I think it comes out very clearly that I, I, it's a very interesting way of phrasing the question. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Peter, do you have uh, some thoughts at the moment? No, no pressure. Um, yeah, I, I just I think I think um, if I understood the question, I don't think there's like a new moment of where we've shifted into different temporal understandings of anything really. Um, but <laughs> but um, uh, I think different memorials, different monuments will elicit different risk, you know, different temporal understandings. I think that might be uh, something I would be willing to say, but um, uh, in terms of uh, the relationship between the more ephemeral versus the more kind of at least short term fixed monuments, right? You're gonna constantly have that tension where the monument fulfills something. You don't have to continue doing these temporary memorials over and over. You can fix it in a monument, but then the context changes, the history changes, and then you're, you're in the situation again. Chichek, uh, I'll just, uh, if it's okay, uh, I'll share some of my thoughts as well. You know, it's reductive, but I do tend to, I, I guess, perhaps I disagree slightly with Peter. Maybe this can be the spur to further conversation. I'm thinking, of course, also of some of uh, Francois Hot Dog's work, which uh, at least the people in my group will remember quite <laughs> uh, clearly since we discussed it recently. But I tend to think that a lot of, I mean, you know, I, it's, it's, it's often depoliticizing to reduce these kind of debates to conflicts of temporality. And I, so I don't want to be depoliticizing in that way. And yet I do think that there's something of a conflict between a 19th century mentality and for uh, what, uh, for lack of a better phrase, we might call a 21st century sensibility going on. It's again reductive to blame everything on virtuality and the internet and social media. And yet I do think there's something about the temporalities and the attention spans and the modes of interaction with uh, both communities and objects that have become naturalized in the age of digital media that render monumentalization something very strange in the in the current moment. And then at the same time, there are attempts to recuperate that on the internet. So thinking about Facebook monuments to people who've died, uh, I, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't actually know much about them, but this is a, a major uh, activity, right? Trying to digitally monumentalize some person or place or thing. And there seems to be a great uh, 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 impasse there because there, 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 it ultimately doesn't work in the same way that public monuments and memorials in, in urban space or in public space generally do. So that's my two cents on the matter, I guess. 10 cents, however many cents one gives. I never know. It doesn't make sense. But uh, uh, are there others who want to join the conversation? We are now running a bit over and I don't want to keep our uh, kind contributors and participants longer than their uh, committed uh, time <laughs> frame. Anush, do you want to go ahead before I have to leave? I want to have to say. Thank you all so much. This has been such oh, a- Oh, Anush, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, you must have been not on your screen. This has been so wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy, and, and your, uh, for organizing this and for all of the speakers. It's so wonderful to see you all. And I, I am just so delighted because I got to take a class with Banu on monuments and monumentalization back at Tavanja years ago, which was like, got me interested in all of this. Um, I'm, I have, I've been thinking through all of these, the ways that monuments are being uh, torn down or taken down or repurposed in ways that are sort of um, along with the Black Lives Matters movement and 
um, sort of decolonization processes. And Chitek's point about how maybe this might be a hopeful turn. But what I keep coming back to is how no matter what uh, these movements, anti-racist movements, et cetera, do, there are these charismatic leaders that come along and they just repurpose monuments for their own sort of evil, nefarious purposes, like uh, Erdogan and the Hagia Sophia, which I, I wonder if you talked about this, Jeremy. I jumped in a little bit late, so I missed the introduction, unfortunately. And how whenever things seem to be going wrong in their uh, polities and they have some other crisis like an economic crisis or a coronavirus, they find some way to repurpose a monument or do something else along those lines to uh, gather their base of support. Like how Trump um, continually is is defending these these white supremacist, supremacist monuments and now saying that we can't have um, race bias training in the US government. Or how just yesterday when he's even, um, he's sick with the coronavirus in a hospital there's somehow that that hospital somehow became some kind of monument and tens of, or tens of supporters showed up outside to to sort of wave at him as he drove by in a motorcade so i wonder i'm i also would like to feel hopeful and i do feel hopeful with these movements going on but i also i'm just always worried about what dark forces are waiting in the wings to repurpose monuments for their own for their own <laughs> for their own um evil ways. So thank you. Thank you, Anush. Uh, uh, among other things, this is a nice segue and we can do a little bit of a uh, sort of self-promotion. Uh, uh, we will be having our next webinar hosted by Empires of Memory will indeed be on Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia more specifically. Uh, that will be coming your way sometime in probably early November uh, and you'll hear about that. Uh, Maybe this is a good moment to uh, offer uh, concluding thoughts uh, to Banu and Peter, and sadly Rahul and, uh, and Susan uh, uh, aren't able to uh, conclude with us, but uh, any, any concluding thoughts or responses to Anoush as well, of course. Please forgive me, guys. I really have to leave because I am in a Zoom, Zoom schedule loop. Um, and Anoush, thank you so much for your um, intervention and i hope we can continue talking and please forgive me that i have to leave at this point i'm really sorry i thank you for the invitation for organizing and please let us know how you're going to how the group is going to proceed in further conversation thank you guys so much Hi. thank you Manu. thank you and no need to apologize we kept you longer than we, than we uh, intended or at least promised thank you bye <laughs>
and steps behind it. So anybody can go up on the pedestal and be a part of the, be, be the leader or be the monument or, you know, in this playful way, which kind of deconstructs the whole point of mon mon monuments and, and makes them shifting kind of eternally. Uh, so I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. This opens to new uh, horizons of conversation as well, from the Vietnam Memorial to the Tomb to the Unknown Soldier, uh, and we could go on and on. But I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone is probably, uh, it seems like two, two hours of Zoom uh, is, is about all the news that's fit to print usually. So uh, I'll just conclude by thanking everyone for taking time out of your day, whether in the morning or the afternoon, to join us in these disorienting times. And a special thanks again to Yelena Chichek and Annika for all of your hard work uh, in helping to put this together. And to Marina and Rami and, uh, and Birgit, uh, uh, without you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So be well uh, and uh, may your encounters with monuments and memorials be as effectively uh, optimistic and unevil as possible in the coming uh, period. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>